Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here at the Heritage Foundation in our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website. Always ask everyone in-house to make sure your cell phones have been turned off as a courtesy. Uh, we, of course, welcome questions from the Internet. They can be sent at any time simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. And, of course, we will post this program within 24 hours on our Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference. Hosting our special guest today is David Azrod. David is director of our B. Kenneth Simon Center for Principles and Politics. He devotes his time and research to increasing public understanding of America's founding principles. He oversees Heritage's work geared to teaching the tenets of the American political tradition to policymakers, elected leaders, and the public at large. Prior to joining us here, he served as assistant director of the of the Simons, excuse me, he served previously as assistant director of the Simon Center. Before joining us, he served two years at the American Council on Trustees and Alumni. In 2007, he was a Publius Fellow at the Claremont Institute in California. He currently is a doctoral candidate in politics at the University of Dallas, writing a dissertation on the foundation of John Locke's political thought. He received a Master's of Arts degree in political science from Carleton University in Ottawa and holds a Master's degree in journalism and political science from Concordia University in Montreal. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, David Azarek. David. Seven score and ten years ago, Abraham Lincoln delivered what is arguably the greatest speech in American history. Standing on the bloodied battlefield of Gettysburg, where dead horse carcasses were still rotting on the ground, Lincoln urged the fractured nation to dedicate itself to the unfinished work of the battle, the vindication of the principle of natural human equality, and of the idea of government of the people, by the people, and for the people, which grows out of it. If Lincoln thought that he could neither add nor detract from the deeds of those who had fought and died for this cause, I don't see how I can add, though I'm pretty sure I could detract, from either his magnificent words and from those of our distinguished speaker today. I think it is therefore altogether fitting and proper that we read Lincoln's speech before Professor Gelzo delivers our annual Kirk Lecture. I'll ask you to pardon my slight accent as I read the 10 sentences, 272 words in all, that make up the address. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor powers to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. To commemorate the 150th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address, we are honored to have Alan Gelzo here with us today. Professor Gelzo is the Henry R. Luce Professor of the Civil War Era at Gettysburg College, where else, as well as the Director of Civil War Era Studies there. 
He has published nine very well-regarded books on Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War era, including most recently, Gettysburg, The Last Invasion, a fine work, the epilogue in particular is beautiful, and Fateful Lightning, A New History of the Civil War and of Reconstruction. He's also published a fine report for the Heritage Foundation entitled, Abraham Lincoln or the Progressives, Who Was the Real Father of Big Government? And to entice you to pick, a cop pick up a copy at the exit, I will not tell you which side he comes down on. You can <laughs> discover for yourselves. Please join me in welcoming one of the country's most renowned and distinguished civil era and Abraham Lincoln scholars, Alan Gelzo. Thank you, David. I'm very glad once again to be here at the Heritage Foundation, although it does remind me of the story Lincoln told on one occasion about a minister who went to the Secretary of State's office in the old state capitol in Springfield, Illinois. He wanted to lease the facilities in the old state capitol for a revival meeting. The Secretary of State was a little dubious about this arrangement. He asked what the subject of the revival meeting would be. The minister replied, well, I'm going to talk about the second coming of Jesus. No, 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 said the Secretary of State. That won't do. If he's been to Springfield once, he won't be back again. <laughs> well, here I am back again, and I'm very glad to be here. Item. On the first anniversary of the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center, a commemoration ceremony at Ground Zero featured New York Governor George Pataki reading the Gettysburg Address. Item. In 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. told a black journalist that his I Have a Dream speech was designed to be a sort of a Gettysburg Address. And he opened it with words directly modeled on the Gettysburg Address. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Item. In the 1935 movie, Ruggles of Red Gap, an English butler played by Charles Lawton set loose on the American frontier establishes his right to a piece of the American dream by reciting in front of a saloon filled with incredulous cowboys the Gettysburg Address. Now, is it too much to ask what exactly is going on here? The short story of the Gettysburg Address is that it was a surprisingly short speech, all of 272 words, delivered by Abraham Lincoln, as part of the dedication ceremonies for the Soldiers National Cemetery at Gettysburg on November 19, 1863, four and a half months after the climactic battle of the American Civil War. But the long story is that no single American utterance has had the staying power or commanded the respect and reverence accorded the Gettysburg Address. It has been engraved on the south wall of the Lincoln Memorial it has been translated in a book devoted to nothing but translations of the Gettysburg Address and analyzed in at least nine full-dress critical studies over the last century. It has become the stuff of American myth and legend, ranging from the story invented in the 1880s that Lincoln wrote the address as an afterthought on the back of an envelope while on the train bringing him to Gettysburg, to the equally dubious story that no one in the audience of 10 to 15,000 people who heard Lincoln read it initially thought it was any good. In truth, Lincoln had been working on his remarks for days before leaving Washington for the dedication ceremonies and had a full, finished version in hand when he boarded the train. As a chronically fussy and unsatisfied editor of his own words, he did write a new ending once he arrived in Gettysburg, but there's nothing which suggests he wrote any part of the address en route. There is even less reason to believe the canard manufactured principally by Lincoln's friend and bodyguard, Ward Hill Lamon, that the address fell as flat as a wall on its hearers at Gettysburg. To the contrary, the response of the American public was at once a mixture of astonishment and admiration. The crowd in the cemetery listened, according to one witness whose letter was published 11 days after the ceremonies, 
As he slowly, clearly read the address, you could not mistake the feeling and sentiment of the vast multitude before him. The same impression was made at a distance by those who read the text of the address in the newspapers. This morning's paper, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote to his publisher the day after the dedication ceremonies, brings the report of Lincoln's brief speech at Gettysburg, which seems to me admirable. Ralph Waldo Emerson echoed Longfellow. Lincoln's brief speech at Gettysburg will not easily be surpassed by words on any recorded occasion. Charles Sumner believed that Lincoln could not have been more mistaken when he suggested that the world would little note nor long remember any of what was said by anyone at the dedication ceremonies. The world, said Sumner, noted at once what he said, and what's more, will never cease to remember it. The battle itself was less important than the speech. Since Simonides wrote the epitaph for those who fell at Thermopylae, nothing equal to them has been breathed over the fallen dead. Within 20 months of its delivery, the address was already being anthologized in elocution primers for memorization and school use. But looked at from a distance, even the myths are backhanded tributes to the address. After all, only a document of near divine inspiration could have been written on a train. And a speech of world historical moment would certainly arch so far above the heads of its first hearers as to leave them baffled. However, historical sheet straightening of this sort only begs the question, which is not really whether people understood the address to have been a mountaintop piece of political rhetoric, but why? it struck people as being so important from the start. Partly this was because of its language. The Gettysburg Address obeys the Churchillian dictum. Short words are best, and the old words, when short, are best of all. Much has been written, and will be written, about the simple grandeur of the address. Its reliance on short, pungent, colloquial vocabulary over against the hyper-inflected, Latinate lexicon beloved of so many school textbooks. And likewise, much has been made, principally by Gary Wills, of its kinship to other classical models which had been made popular in the textbooks, especially that of the Greeks. And, of course, in 1865, Charles Sumner had immediately conjured a comparison to Simonides. In 1991, Gary Wills drew his connection to Pericles. Both of these, I think, miss a larger point about political speech in the American Republic. Speech was not an either-or proposition between vernacular and classical. Instead, it fluctuated on a spectrum that included at least four kinds of speech. Vernacular or folk speech, technical speech, middle speech, and classical speech. What Lincoln represented was middling speech, the speech of the lawyers, popular preachers, and newspapers. Middling speech was a mark above the slangy bluntness of folk speech without overreaching for the inflated, euphemistic, self-conscious speech of the literati. It was the same middle ground occupied significantly by both the Whig and Republican parties who aspired to represent neither America's landholding and slaveholding elites nor its hard-handed agrarians. Middling speech was, so to speak, bi-dialectical. It used slang, as Lincoln sometimes did, to the discomfort of the prissy. But it was also rational enough to sustain an argument. And it frequently alternated between an offhand inelegance and peaks of refined professionalism. The middling style was what George Tickner Curtis called a talking style, with a little more of elegant dishabille, a free, bold, Anglo-Saxon hittingness. Well, the Gettysburg Address was an example of exactly these alternative poles of middling speech in its very opening words. On July 7th, 
1863, speaking to a re an exultant crowd which had gathered in the White House driveway to cheer Lincoln for the newly announced victories at Vicksburg and Gettysburg, Lincoln offered what we can consider as the first draft of the Gettysburg Address, except, of course, that it was unplanned for and informal. Lincoln said, how long ago is it? Eighty odd years? Since on the 4th of July, for the first time in the history of the world, a nation by its representatives assembled and declared as a self-evident truth that all men are created equal. That was the birthday of the United States of America. Now, on this last 4th of July, just past, when we have a gigantic rebellion at the bottom of which is an effort to overthrow the principle that all men were created equal, we have the surrender of a most powerful position and army on that very day, and not only so, but in a succession of battles in Pennsylvania, near to us through three days, so rapidly fought that they might be called one great battle on the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of the month of July, and on the 4th, the cohorts of those who opposed the declaration that all men are created equal turned tail and run. All the elements of the Gettysburg Address are contained in this off-the-cuff original. But they begin in a rough vernacular, spun off by the moment. How long ago is it? Eighty-odd years? And strung along in a single, awkwardly run-together sentence. Mercifully, four and a half months later, this is going to become four score and seven years ago, and a self-evident truth that all men are created equal will become and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Four score and seven years ago is, therefore, an improvement over a vernacular version of the Gettysburg Address. But it is an improvement. It's a stretch toward refinement. It doesn't stretch all the way to the classical. The model from which Lincoln develops this new vocabulary of fourscore and seven years comes not from Simonides or Pericles, but from a contemporary political speech, a highly touted thank you given in July of 1861 by Pennsylvania Congressman Galusha Grow after his election as Speaker of the House of Representatives. Grow said, Four score years ago, 56 bold merchants, farmers, lawyers, and mechanics, the representatives of a few feeble colonists scattered along the Atlantic seaboard, met in convention to found a new empire based on the inalienable rights of man. Sound familiar? However, we may want to characterize Galusha Grow. He was not Pericles. <laughs> and neither is Lincoln. And given the popularity of Gros's speech, an example of middling speech, and the even more overwhelming popularity of the Gettysburg Address, what we may be able to see in the address is the overthrow of the prestige and dominance of classical speech in American rhetoric and its rapid consignment to oddity. The Gettysburg Address thus marks the end of a culture of eloquence, burying it alongside the soldiers in the National Cemetery and the elevation of the middling style of speech. But much more obvious than any classical models for Lincoln's vocabulary, we are most apt to notice his biblical similes. Four score and seven years ago is, of course, a rhetorical shadow of the meditation on the brevity of human life the days of our years are three score years and ten. In Psalm 90, verse 10, in the authorized version of 1611, the new nation which the founders brought forth upon this continent is likewise a shadow of Luke 2, verse 7, where the Virgin Mary brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. But certainly the most obvious biblical allusion was the one reserved for the end of the address, that dedication to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, which will result in a new birth of freedom. The new birth 
being not only an echo of the third chapter of St. John's Gospel, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, but this was also the rallying cry of every evangelical Protestant revivalist since the Great Awakening. We preach unto them Christ and the new birth, declared George Whitfield. Subtract the new birth, added John Wesley, and in what is Christianity better than heathenism? Lincoln obviously did not mind borrowing the vocabulary of the authorized version. It had been ground to familiarity in his childhood, and it provided an easy rhetorical connection to a population which still understood and embraced the authorized version as tantamount to God's own speech. But once again, the prominence of these allusions in the address may have less to do with any deliberate intention to impose a religious meaning on the Civil War. Lincoln, after all, was a man of remarkably minimal religious profile, and more with his overall desire to confine himself to middling speech. For the authorized version was very much the property of middling speakers. The 19th century saw two major campaigns to unseat the dominance of the authorized version, the first in the 1830s and the second in the 1880s, culminating in the creation of the revised version of 1881 to 85. But the revisers were bitterly contested at almost every turn precisely because they represented the interests of scholars, linguists, and historians in producing a document more in harmony with their own elite expectations of the present standard of biblical scholarship. <coughs> While the authorized version was, for all of its Elizabethan and Jacobean origins, clung to determinedly by middle-class evangelicals for another century. It is not the vocabulary, the language of the Gettysburg Address, which makes it famous if only because the language was really so devoutly middling. But perhaps something can be said for the address's compactness as an explanation for its popularity. It is short, and therefore easy to remember and to memorize. It was, to be sure, intended to be short, because Lincoln had not been invited to deliver an oration, but in the words of the invitation issued by the energetic David Wills, to formally set apart these grounds to their sacred use by a few appropriate remarks. As Lincoln told the journalist Noah Brooks, my speech isn't long. It is short, short, short. There would be a formal oration, but it would not be delivered by Lincoln. Instead, it would be delivered by the formidable Massachusetts orator Edward Everett, former Massachusetts congressman and governor, U.S. senator, briefly, member of President Millard Fillmore's cabinet, president of Harvard, and most recently and ironically, the vice presidential candidate in 1860 on the short-lived Constitutional Union ticket, running against Lincoln. And along with Everett, there would be a lengthy prayer from the congressional chaplain, Thomas Stockton, an ode composed by Benjamin French, and a benediction pronounced by the president of nearby Pennsylvania College, Henry L. Bauger, whose son lay buried in the nearby town cemetery, mortally wounded at Shiloh the year before. Everett, as the principal draw of the November 19th ceremonies, delivered a two-and-a-half-hour, 13,000-word doozy of an address. <laughs> it was, in its own way, a perfectly respectable example of classical rhetorical art, coming from the former occupant of Harvard's Eliot chair in Greek literature, and much, much more classical in its shape than Lincoln's. Everett began by reminding the thousands who crowded into the new cemetery that it was appointed by law in Athens, a place which he reminded them he had visited personally. <laughs> it was appointed by law in Athens that the obsequies of the citizens who fell in battle should be performed at the public expense and in the most honorable manner. From there, Everett proceeded to invoke those who fell at Marathon, 
Horace's maxim that it is sweet and becoming to die for one's country. Romulus, Cyrus, and Caesar, and concluding with a quotation from Thucydides. The whole earth, said Pericles, as he stood over the remains of his fellow citizens who had fallen in the first year of the Peloponnesian War, the whole earth is the sepulcher of illustrious men. The problem with Everett's oration was that it was all length and no soundbite. And at the end, there was little alternative to memorizing the whole thing or simply forgetting it. <laughs> Lincoln's long suit, on the other hand, was his capacity to capture an idea in the fewest and clearest words possible. John Todd Stewart who had been his first mentor in reading law and who knew Lincoln for over 30 years, thought that Lincoln was simply by temperament, logical, mathematical. He had nothing rhetorical in his nature. Lincoln, after all, had been a trial lawyer in a state where juries were still pulled into the jury box from bystanders. And he would either make his point clearly and swiftly to them, or he would not be practicing law for very long. He did not rate professional orators like Everett very highly. And to Noah Brooks, Lincoln singled out Everett as a particularly grinding example of sound and fury signifying nothing. Now, do you know, I think Edward Everett was very much overrated, Lincoln said. There was one speech in which, addressing a statue of John Adams and a picture of Washington in Faneuil Hall, Boston, he apostrophized them and said, Teach us the love of liberty protected by law. That, Lincoln admitted, was very fine, but it was only a good idea introduced by noble language. Looked at from that angle, Lincoln is a man of no verbal wastage. In the address, he describes the past and what it did, which is create a republic of equal citizens, then describes what the people at the ceremonies are doing in the present, dedicating a cemetery, and then moves on to what they're to do for the future, dedicate themselves to the same principles the soldiers were dedicated to. In that way, the address is almost anorexic. It makes no mention of slavery, the Constitution, or democracy, paints no great picture of the battle, and even fails to acknowledge the civilian politicians. David Wills of Gettysburg, Andrew Curtin, the governor of Pennsylvania, who had made the purchase of the cemetery acreage possible in the first place. And yet, for all of its compactness, the Gettysburg Address is not that compact. It is not that technical. The Address is not a treatise made to be read so much as it is an exhortation made to be heard. It may be only 272 words long, but those 272 words are strung out into 10 complicated sentences, all of which are much more cumbersome to parse on the page than they are to hear in the open. And Lincoln does not mind throwing compactness to the wind when he wants to make a lilting impression on the ear. The repetitive triplets, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground and government of the people, by the people, for the people. Those repetitions are a puzzling luxury if we consider the address only as a terse alternative to Everett, inclining to still more terseness. It is, like middling speech, an effort to persuade rather than an ornament or a decoration. Each stroke of the triplet is a powerful pull on the convictions of Lincoln's listeners, hauling them upwards toward climaxes that overcome the attentive mind with emotion, even as they persuade it with logic. For Lincoln's hearers, however, what held an even greater attraction for them than its vocabulary or its style was the direct meaning of the address, which is, surprisingly, the single aspect of the address we are least likely to recognize at once. And that is largely because we do not see Lincoln's subject, the survival of democracy, as Lincoln saw it or saw democracy itself. For Lincoln, democracy was an isolated, 
and beleaguered island in a world dominated by monarchies, tyrants, and status. We take democracy for granted as the default position of human societies, as the natural template for modern politics, as the end of history. Like Thomas Jefferson in 1826, we are confident that the light of science has already laid open to every view the palpable truth that the mass of mankind has not been born with saddles on their backs, nor a favored few booted and spurred ready to ride them. But in truth, even as Jefferson wrote those words, the confidence of the founders that the disorders, oppressions, and incertitude of Europe will terminate very much in favor of the rights of man was evaporating. The French Revolution, which promised to be the American Revolution's beachhead in Europe, swiftly circled downwards in the reign of terror and then the tyranny of Bonaparte, democratic uprisings in Spain in 1820, in Russia in 1825, in France in 1830, and across Europe in 1848, were crushed, were subverted by newly renascent monarchies and romantic philosophers, glorying in regimes built upon blood, soil, and nationality, rather than the rights of man. At every point, democracy, government by the consent of the governed, lay discredited and disgraced, and a cynical Prussian nobleman, Otto von Bismarck, could advise his French counterpart that although he said that in his early life his tendencies were all toward republicanism, he, Bismarck, had discovered that when you have governed men for several years, you, a liberal, will be transformed from a Republican to a monarchist. Believe me, one cannot lead or bring to prosperity a great nation without the principle of authority, that is, the monarchy. The outbreak of the American Civil War only gave the monarchs further reason to rejoice because the success of the American democracy was the one thing which unsettled their captive peoples and threw their theories about the superiority of autocracy into a shade. That this troublesome democracy would, in 1861, obligingly proceed to blow its own brains out and to do it in defense of the virtues of human slavery gave the monarchs no end of delight the success of the slaveholding secessionists in America would, said the king of the Belgians, Leopold I, with a sigh of relief, raise a barrier against the United States and provide a support for the monarchical aristocratic principle in the southern states. Lincoln also saw the Civil War as the question of democracy, only from precisely the opposite perspective as Bismarck and Leopold. Did secession and the war really mean that democracy was inherently defective? That it would be forever throwing off secessions as unhappy special interests found majority rule breaking in other ways than they had desired and deciding simply to dispense with majority rule by walking off and setting up their own shops? And was the democracy they thus seceded from too bovine, too ordinary, too bourgeois to make the sacrifices necessary to prevent the secession and keep the democratic principle operating? This nation, Lincoln said, had been dedicated to the democratic proposition that all men were created equal. The Civil War was the test of whether democratic regimes whether this nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. It has survived two severe tests of such a government, the successful establishing and the successful administering of it. But there remained, Lincoln said, one final test, its successful maintenance against a formidable internal attempt to overthrow it. And that test was now upon them. The central idea pervading this struggle, he told his secretary, John Hay, back at the beginning of the war, is the necessity of proving that popular government is not an absurdity. 
For if we fail, it will go far to prove the incapability of the people to govern themselves. If democracies were too unstable to prevent their own self-disintegration and too feckless to stop self-disintegration when it started, then the folly and instability of democracy would lie open and exposed for all time and the collapse of what Lincoln called the last best hope of Earth could be considered proof positive of the need for a Bismarck or a Leopold to run the show. The Battle of Gettysburg, with its astounding and seemingly bottomless list of dead and maimed, offered Lincoln the first substantial glimmer during the war that the test would indeed be passed. Gettysburg was not only a victory, but a victory won with the Union armies back to the wall, and its news came with symbolic appropriateness on the anniversary of American independence. Above all, the victory was itself the product of enormous self-sacrifice. 3,903 Union dead, 18,735 wounded, 5,425 missing, more than twice the losses of the French at Solferino in 1859, more than the British and French combined at the Alma in 1854, three times the Prussian losses at Königgratz in 1866, a third again more than all the British and Allied casualties at Waterloo. And these dead were not professional soldiers. Wellington's scum of the earth who had taken their shilling and their chance together. Nor were they dispirited peasants driven into battle by the whips of their betters, but precisely those ordinary bourgeois citizens whom democracy's cultured despisers had laughingly doubted would ever be made to do anything but calculate profits and losses. These people whom Heinrich Heine dismissed in 1834 as boors living in that big pig pen of freedom. These people whom Niklaus Lenau raged at as appallingly dull, ein schmatt, and possessed of a strange cold mirth, in ein sonderbaren Kult and Heiterkeit. These people whom Charles Dickens sneered at as the ebb of honest men's contempt. These people had risen up and offered everything they had, present and future, that that nation might live. Looking out over the semicircular rows of graves in the Gettysburg Cemetery, Lincoln saw in them a transcendence that few people, then or now, have been willing to concede to liberal democracy. And in that transcendence, he saw something all Americans could borrow, a renewed dedication to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion to popular self-government of the people, by the people, for the people. The genius of the address thus lay, not in its language, not in its brevity, virtues though those were, but in its triumphant repudiation of the criticisms of democracy and in the new birth it gave to those who had become discouraged and wearied by democracy's follies. It's worth remembering how central a position the address gives to those who fought here because there is a fourth reason for the high esteem in which we hold the Gettysburg Address and that is that the Union won the Civil War. The Gettysburg Address is a remarkably optimistic document. And not surprisingly, a lot of its optimism was drawn from the euphoria following the battle and the fall of Vicksburg, which together gave Lincoln and the Union the happiest season they'd enjoyed in the war since the early spring of 1862. The successes of the summer of 1863 continued, too, as Port Hudson surrendered after Vicksburg and opened the Mississippi River to complete control by Union forces followed by the near bloodless capture of the rebel railhead at Chattanooga. And there were political victories too. 
against every prediction that summer, anti-war Copperhead candidates for governor in Ohio and Pennsylvania were resoundingly defeated in the fall elections. The signs look better, Lincoln said. The father of waters again goes unvexed to the sea. Peace does not appear so distant as it did. And with it would come proof that democracies are not doomed to self-destruction and that among free men there can be no successful appeal from the ballot to the bullet. But in the event, Lincoln's optimism turned out to be cruelly premature. There was much bloody work ahead. And if it had not gone well, if Grant had not taken Richmond, or Sherman had not taken Atlanta, or Farragut not closed off Mobile Bay, and especially if Lincoln had not been reelected, then the war would have turned to a very different conclusion. With an independent Southern Confederacy hugging the Gulf and South Atlantic coastlines, strangling the Mississippi River Valley, and spreading its imperialistic pro-slavery tentacles into the Caribbean and Central America. While the Northern Union shrank into a Scandinavian irrelevance. <laughs> After that, the Gettysburg Address would not and could not have been hailed as acknowledging some great and stirring truth, but instead would come down to us as a piece of minor political huff and puff on behalf of a sinking cause. If we remembered the address at all under those circumstances, it would be in precisely the same way we remember the equally optimistic pronouncements of that other American president of the 1860s, Jefferson Davis who also had a great deal to say about the prospects of an independent slave republic, but who is today taken no more seriously than we do the post-game commentary of losing coaches. <laughs> Without vindication in arms, the Gettysburg Address would indeed have become <coughs> little noted and not very long remembered. And the multitudes buried in the National Cemetery would literally have died in vain. And all of that lovely eloquence, terseness, and meaning built into the address would have counted for nothing but for those soldiers. The Gettysburg Address is, when we reduce it to its minimum, only the remarks of an American president spoken as the dedication of a National Cemetery. Unlike the Emancipation Proclamation, they cannot be taken into a court of law to prove anything. And they certainly did not, as the Proclamation did, set three million slaves legally and forever free. And yet no one I know memorizes the Emancipation Proclamation or cites it as a remarkable piece of public rhetoric. But as the items I listed at the beginning attest, we do come back as Americans over and over again to the Gettysburg Address. Sometimes it seems that the address is simply an example of something being well known for being well known. And it may be to avoid the phenomenon of empty celebrity that we fix on its vocabulary or on its compactness as explanations for its high and enduring standing. It is really the meaning of the address which struck observers in 1863. That this has become dimmed in our celebrations of the address is partly due to its own success. We see the Civil War today as an issue in racial justice or as a critical moment in constitutional history, which is what leads us to wonder why slavery and the Constitution do not appear in the Gettysburg Address. But the truth is that the Gettysburg Address speaks to an issue which flew far above both slavery and jurisprudence, the issue on which the resolution of our racial injustices and constitutional shortcomings all actually depended, and that was the survival of democracy itself. For what we did about race or slavery or the Constitution would become massively irrelevant if democracy itself went down. But Lincoln was not under any illusions that he could save democracy merely by his own rhetorical power. He was more right than we think when he said that the world would little note nor long remember what we say here, because all that was said that November day by himself 
and by Everett, by Thomas Stockton, by Henry Bauger, by Benjamin French, the third-rate poet, all of that rested on never forgetting what they did here. It was from them, from the soldiers, from the victorious Union armies, that the new birth of freedom would emerge. Perhaps in the end, the greatness we have not suspected in the address lies in its humility, in its reminder that the question of democracy's survival rested ultimately not in the hands of czars, but in the hands of ordinary citizens in uniform who saw something in democracy worth dying for, something that kings or slave masters or bureaucrats or even Georgetown cocktail parties could never understand what we needed and got so memorably from Lincoln was that reminder. We could use it again today. Thank you very much. David tells me we'll do questions for a few minutes. Um, and you know the drill, state your name, and please, no speeches. Uh, if Lincoln kept it to 272 <laughs> words, you too. Notice I was not able to do that today. Yes. Hi, my name is Lex McCusker. I would appreciate if you'd help us moderns understand the etiquette around the Gettysburg Address Day. How is it that Congressman from Massachusetts gives the oratory and the president gives 273 words in passing. Hard to, hard to contemplate these days. Well, in the first place, they could be fairly sure of getting Everett to come, but they could not be sure of Lincoln. Lincoln was a desk-bound president in a lot of ways. Uh, unlike other presidents, in fact, unlike Jefferson Davis, he rarely leaves Washington, even under the most pressing circumstances. Abraham Lincoln is a workaholic not to put it too finely. And he routinely turns down invitations to speak here, there, everywhere, even an invitation that same fall to speak at a mass, statewide mass uh, meeting in his hometown of Springfield, Illinois. So it was not entirely clear that Lincoln was, in fact, going to be able to accept an invitation. It wasn't, in fact, until two days before he actually left for the cemetery dedication that he actually sends a definite signal, I'm coming. On the other hand, he really was determined to come. He had exhorted all of his cabinet members to come with him. Three of them did. Well, that was half the cabinet, so that's, that's, a, that's not bad. That's not bad. But there is a certain element of question. Is the President of the United States actually going to be here? Should we count on a major address coming from him? And the answer, just simply in prudential terms, is no, we'd better not. Second thing is that everybody knew that Edward Everett was a great orator and that he would deliver an oration, a Latinate, Greek-style, classical oration, commensurate with the event. Whereas Abraham Lincoln's reputation as a public speaker is still on the cusp. It's still developing. There are many people who are still wondering, as one newspaper editor did when Lincoln was inaugurated, who is going to write this ignorant man's state papers for him? <laughs> So if you did the contrast between Lincoln, who not only did not go to Harvard, but in fact didn't go anywhere else either, who was a lawyer of some state reputation, but not a member of the cabinet, never a member of the Senate, one term in the House of Representatives, but that was it, never mayor of Springfield, never governor of Illinois. If you had to, if you had to, to put the two beside each other, for the purposes of a major oration, you would probably have been wise to go with Edward Everett. And if Lincoln can come, well, he can do the few appropriate remarks. So it's more a matter of practicality in the mind of the organizers. What is going to work and what can we count on most that dictates that particular piece of etiquette? Yes. Yes, right, right, right. Uh, Stan Sienkiewicz, 
Could you shed a bit of attention, a little light on the influence of or relationship between Henry Clay and Lincoln? Lincoln said that Henry Clay was his beau ideal of a statesman. Uh, Lincoln, from the very first time that he enters into politics, enters as an admirer of Henry Clay and Henry Clay's American system, the system upon which the Whig Party was built. That's a system which, in its bare bones, talks about national tariffs to protect American manufacturing, about a national monetary or banking system, and about government funding for internal improvements, transportation projects. Basically, what Henry Clay is talking about is government which sees itself as an enabler for business, for creating a business environment, for promoting American economic success. Because only by promoting that economic success is the American Republic going to, to be able to bulk up sufficiently to fend off the threats of monarchical empires to reverse the course of American democracy. Lincoln not only espouses Clay's American system on the state level as a state legislator, when he enters Congress in 1847, he does it as a Whig, speaking for the Whigs. He campaigns for the Whig candidate, Zachary Taylor. And even after the Whig Party dies in 1856 and he joins the Republican Party, he continues to describe himself as an old Henry Clay Whig. That's right up until 1865. And his critics in the opposition in Congress likewise described him, but with less compliment, as just another old Western-style Whig. So that connection with Lincoln and the Whigs and Henry Clay, it's a very important one. It's one that's difficult to get my students to take seriously, because who can take seriously a party named Whig? <laughs> so just to impress this on them, I have, a, I have a sweatshirt I put on. I wear this for election days. Vote Whig. <laughs> and that's, that's just enough of a peek to the curiosity to understand what that meant for Abraham Lincoln. But he really did consider himself a Whig. He is... On the one hand, he, yes, is the, is the first Republican president, but in a very real sense, he's actually the last and ultimate Whig president. James, James this is the Heritage Foundation. Um, you were fairly critical of Edward Everett, uh, and, and I know that uh, some other authors... He's a target-rich environment. <laughs> <laughs> Two and a half hours worth of targets. Uh, I, I know Gary Wills was much more uh, uh, positive about his speech. He would be. Uh, okay. <laughs> Can you tell us, uh, you know, uh, what was, was his speech uh, uh, above average or below average for the conventions at the time, and how was it received? Take Edward Everett's speech as a freestanding event. It's actually, it's a very good speech. It's, it's really a history lesson. Because he gives you, in two and a half hours, he gives you um, the history of the tensions around secession, uh, how they happened, how the Civil War broke out. He gives you a capsule history of the Battle of Gettysburg and doesn't mind telling you that he's consulted with General Meade to get the details. He gives a shout-out to Pennsylvania College mathematics professor Michael Jacobs, who had written the first book on the subject. Jacobs was, was trying to be entrepreneur. He sent advanced copies to Lincoln and to Everett, hoping they would draw attention to the book in their speech. Everett took the bait and did. Lincoln didn't. But taken as a whole, link, I mean, Everett's speech is, is a fairly respectable example of this highly classicized, highly Latinate, upper-level elite speech. And it's a good example, and if you like that sort of thing, as Lincoln said, that's the sort of thing you will like. <laughs> but is it a great speech? Mm, not really. In fact, Edward Everett himself wrote to Lincoln afterwards, confessing a little ruefully, that if I had said in my two and a half hours as much as you said in your two and a half minutes, I would be very happy with myself. So we'll let Edward Everett's own review stand for his opinion of his own remarks. Milton Grenfell, uh, thank you for a very fine talk, about a very fine talk. Um, how do you square the line a uh, government of the people, for the people, and by the people with the notion that what, nine states were being kept in at gunpoint? They weren't being kept at gunpoint. There were rebels in those nine states who had illegally raised their fist against the American flag and against the Constitution. They were rebels and they were traitors. And I would suppress them with as much energy as Lincoln did. 
<laughs> we'll take one last question. <laughs> if there is one. Okay, well, oh, Ken? Okay, Ken. As, I'm, I'm glad to acknowledge Ken Masugi here. Uh, hi. Uh, to that list of uh, people referring to the Gettysburg Address, you might refer to Franklin Roosevelt, who instead of, uh, in, in his 1938 uh, remarks at Gettysburg, uh, and again, in a brief speech, uh, rather than resurrecting the dead, which is what Lincoln was doing, uh, he really robbed uh, the graves of their bodies and tried to use them for uh, the purposes of the New Deal. And I, I think this is a high instance, a great instance of body snatching um, <laughs> on the part of FDR for the sake of progressive big government. Now, this is supposed to segue into Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter? Or, uh, <laughs> uh, actually, I, I have a, that's the first time I've ever heard uh, FDR uh, uh, categorized as a body snatcher. I've heard him said, described in many a different ways. This is a new one. I have to add this to the list. Um, I have my own problems with um, the 1938 uh, appearance of Roosevelt there, although it's actually geared more to the fact that, first of all, in 1938, the Gettysburg battlefield had just been put into the hands of the National Park Service. It had previously been administered by a private organization, the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association, then by the War Department, and then in the early 1930s, it's handed over to the Department of the Interior and the Park Service. The first superintendent, unfortunately, was a landscape architect. He had no feel for the sense of preserving it as a battlefield. He wanted to pretty it up as a park. And so he bulldozes historic buildings on the battlefield. And one of the ones he bulldozes is the Forney Farm on Oak Ridge in order to make way for the construction and dedication in 1938 of what became known as the Eternal Peace Monument. And it is that that Roosevelt uh, is speaking at the dedication of that. And I've always found something really <sighs> lewdly annoying about it. Um, not so much the speech, but the, just the whole timing of the ceremony, because this takes place in the summer of 1938. We're dedicating an eternal peace monument in the summer of 1938? What were they thinking? I mean, Hitler's about to go to Munich and meet Chamberlain. Kristallnacht is only a couple of months away. So I look at that and I think, this, this is a, an example of how timing is everything. And, and it really is kind of a blown save, you might say. So I look at the Eternal Peace Monument. It's one of my nominees for something to be removed from the battlefield uh, and, and restoration, at least, of another part to its 1863 appearance. But that is, that is my fundamental complaint. Of course, connected with that, there is one other. There's a Ronald Reagan connection to this, Ken, which I'm sure you'll, you'll appreciate. Uh, during the, the first major energy crisis in, in the late 1970s in the Carter administration, as part of his uh, Cardigan Sweater Initiative, um, you know, the great malaise, uh, Carter ordered the gas light at the top of the Eternal Peace Monument turned off. <laughs> yeah, that really did a lot. Um, I'm sure people in, in Riyadh were clutching their chests and falling over. <laughs> But one of the first things that Ronald Reagan does after he's inaugurated is to issue an executive order. Relight that thing. <laughs> and you know, at that point, you know, okay, we're back on track. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Alan.